I should mention that uh, Dan Moat would have been here. He wanted me to apologize personally for him. He's the president of the university. Uh, he is actually out in, in Seattle giving a talk today on the importance of science and engineering, both in research and, and education, to the nation in terms of future competitiveness. Now, I mention that only because that's one of the typical problems that a future senator will have to address. And it's one of the challenging questions that the nation is now facing, I think. And, and Dan apologized and asked me to express his appreciation. What, one of the things that, that he emphasizes and that we do here at the university is the opportunity that a university has for an unbiased, independent, objective assessment of the major issues of our time. And that's the reason we're so excited to have this debate here tonight, because in fact, they will be addressing these critical issues. And I'd like to suggest that all of you turn off your cell phones here as well. Uh, I think one note I'd like to end on, and that's a personal note, having served in the government uh, last as an Undersecretary of Defense and once before that, I spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill testifying before the U.S. Senate. And I have to say that what these gentlemen are proposing to do is truly a public service. It is, a, it is a major sacrifice. It is very, very important. And that's why we're very pleased that really top people are willing to sacrifice that way, to, to give their time, to give their effort. And my wife used to tease me when I was in the government. She, she would say, now let's see, Jack, why do we do this? You work three times as hard, you get one-tenth the salary, and you get constant abuse from the press and even sometimes from Congress. And, you know, what, what is the reason? Well, it's, it's a public duty. It's a public service. And we, we are really thankful that these gentlemen are willing to represent the state of Maryland in the U.S. Senate. I want to personally thank them for that. <laughs> On that note, let me turn it back to Doug. Obi Patterson. Good evening. Again, my name is Obi Patterson. And on behalf of the African American Democratic Club of Georgia, of gorgeous Prince George's, let me also welcome you here again this evening. Let me also thank you for coming out in such a hot, hot uh, climate to be with us, to share this occasion with each one of you. We want to properly acknowledge the Norman and Florence Brody Public Policy Forum for playing a very key part in putting this activity together. We could not have done it without you, so certainly we are indebted to you, and we do really, really do appreciate your support. This is a very special evening. This is an evening when we can uh, look close, listen, and strew out the candidates as they present their platform to us so we can then make better informed decisions when we go to the polls on September the 12th and select the next senator for the state of Maryland. And with that, I want to say congratulations to each of the candidates and let the party begin. <laughs> I think I get to say, candidates, take your seats. Uh, we have a relatively complicated program for this evening because uh, we wanted two things to happen. We wanted both of our guest questioners, and I will introduce them in a moment, to be able to ask a question of each of the candidates. We also wanted each of the candidates to have an opportunity to be the lead answer person of, in the debate. So. Trust me, we're pretty sure it's, notice I said pretty sure, but we're pretty sure it's going to work. When uh, Ron Walters asks the first question, it will be of Mr. Lickman. Mr. Lickman will answer. He'll have two minutes to answer. The next three candidates get to respond to Mr. Lickman. Then Mr. Lickman gets to rebut. Uh, the times will be carefully policed by our police timers over here. We have a little business here that lights Green, that's when they start. Yellow, when it's 15 seconds before the end. And red, when they're supposed to stop. I've already warned them. They can finish a sentence, but if the sentence goes on for more than three or four paragraphs, <laughs> I say, I'm sorry, you'll have to cut that off right now. Uh, I'll do it with a smile, but I need your help. Otherwise, we'll be here till midnight, and we do not want that. Um, Okay, a few other uh, rules that I want to tell you about. Um, first, 
no applauding or noises during the debate. Really try, because all that does is take time away from the candidates talking. If you're applauding your own candidate, you're just taking time away from his uh, opportunities. Uh, I don't see any signs, thank you, but please, no signs. You can keep your shirts on, uh, but no waving of signs. Um, I have a piece of paper. I don't expect to have to use it, but you see the gentleman in blue over there. Uh, I am, for the next hour and a half, able to say, if you don't sit down and be quiet, he'll take you out of here. Uh, before we begin, again, those of you who have your cell phones on or whatever, please turn them off. Uh, I'd like to introduce our candidates and our questioners before we begin. I'm going to introduce them in the order uh, that they will answer questions. First is Alan Lickman, who is a professor and former chair of the History Department at American University. He's the author of six books and testified as an expert witness in many civil rights cases. Uh, our second um, candidate is Kwaize uh, Mfume former president and CEO of the NAACP, and before that he was a member of the Baltimore City Council and the U.S. House of Representatives. Our third candidate is Thomas McCaskill. He's a research phys physicist who worked at the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory for 42 years, and he made contributions in the design of the global positioning system, GPS, what we use in our cars, if we have those kinds of fancy cars. Our fourth candidate is Benjamin Cardin, a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, who was first elected in 1986. Before being in the, uh, before being in the House of Representatives, he served in the House of Delegates, and at one point he was Speaker of the House. If you see me shuffling papers, it's because the order of the speaker was decided by uh, uh, drawing of lots just a few minutes ago, and so I'm shifting my sheets as we go. Um, our fifth candidate is Josh Rails, who is an entrepreneur and philanthropist. His company, RFI Associates, has been a leader in the redevelopment of moderate income um, family housing throughout Maryland, uh, and he and his wife founded RFI Foundation, which supports charitable causes in Maryland. Um, our last candidate is, where's my piece of paper here, is uh, Robert Kaufman, who is a social activist and for the past six, de six decades has been active in various causes here in Maryland. I mentioned before that we have two wonderful guest questioners. Uh, Ron Walters, who won the toss, which means that he will go first is the director of the African American Leadership Institute and Scholar Practitioner Program um, at the James McGregor Burns Academy of Leadership and a professor here at the University of Maryland. Uh, he's the author of over 100 articles and eight books. And I understand from chatting with him that he and Juan have a regular gig on NPR. Juan Williams, delighted to have Juan here, is senior correspondent for Morning Edition at National Public Radio. Uh, um, in 2000 and 2001, he hosted NPR's call-in show, Talk of the Nation, and he is the author of a wonderful book called Thurgood Marshall, American Revolutionary. Um, Ron Walters, you get the first question. We have to get this out of here. Give me a moment to get in position. Uh, gentlemen, good luck, and uh, thank you for being oh, with us. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> opening statement. You can tell what planning this event was like, especially when I misspeak. Uh, each candidate gets one minute for an opening statement, and by the pick of the draw, it starts with Mr. Lickman. Thank you. I'm not a professional politician, but I am here to speak from the heart about what really matters, and that's joining together to make government work again for you and not the wealthy special interests that today dominate Washington. I'm running to be the only lifetime teacher in the United States Senate, the voice for our most neglected constituents, teachers, parents, and 100 million children and young adults in America. 
I'm running as someone who's worked with you as an expert witness in 70 civil rights cases across Maryland and America. Six times I went to Texas to testify against Tom DeLay and his violation of African American and Latino voting rights. It's time now to end the war in Iraq, stop the killing, bring the resources back to your community, and again support in your local community jobs, health care, education, and public safety. Thank you. I'm Kwaisi Mfume. I, uh, I was the first candidate that got into this race almost 17 months ago. And I want you to think throughout this about one thing, that in 55 days, you, the people of the state, get a chance to make a decision. Not the good old boys in back rooms and smoke cigars and, and try to plot our future, but you. Don't let people put the divisions on you. They will try to put race on you. They'll try to use ethnicity against you. They will use one region of the state against the other. They'll tell you you're an outsider or you're an insider. You are voters. You deserve every right to make a real decision. And this time, no matter what anybody says, we are having a campaign, not a coronation. And I urge you to listen closely tonight and to ask us questions afterwards and to understand one thing. I do this because, like you, I believe that leadership comes from the bottom up, not from the top down. And this is an opportunity to fix our government that's broke in Washington. <laughs> Good evening, Thomas McCaskill. Mr. McCaskill, just give me one second. When we plan the debate, we ask the candidates to stay at their chairs and so forth. I think what we'll do is uh, we'll loosen the rule a little bit for now, but then we'll ask you when you're answering the questions, <laughs> stay at your chairs, you can stand, you can sit. But, uh, I right to yeah, I know, and we'll let you do it in your closing <laughs> statement. Uh, so we'll let it happen now, but during the questions and answers, please stay in your place. Mr. McCaskill. Good evening. Thomas McCaskill, a Democrat, and I'm proud to be a Democrat. Thanks for coming. Thanks to the African American Democratic Club, University of Maryland, the Brodies, uh, for this having this debate. We're, we're supposed to have seven. Remember the movie, The Magnificent Seven? I think of it, we've lost one, but The Magnificent Seven Democrats. We're all united in the same cause. The job of the president is to run the country, not ruin the country. We had to go to war after 9-11, but we did not have to go to war, the preemptive war. We need to change course from one of isolation and fear to one of global peace and security. That's going to be easy to remember. That's GPS. We need to form a coalition of the nations that love and want freedom. <laughs> let me thank you all for being here tonight and thank you for holding this forum. First, let me apologize for being late. Congress was in session tonight voting. We started the votes on st embryonic stem cell research. Tomorrow, I'm going to vote to override the President's likely veto to on embryonic stem cell research. It makes a difference who we have in the United States Senate and who we have in the House of Representatives. It won't be the first time that I've stood up to this administration. I'm the only person running for the United States Senate that voted against giving the President the right to use force in Iraq. I did it when the popular vote was to give the President everything he wanted. I have voted consistently against this administration's efforts to cut funds for higher education and making it more costly for students to attend college. It's time for a change. I'm the one who can bring it. I know how to get things done in Washington, and I ask for your support. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank the African American Democratic Club for sponsoring this event. It's been 52 years since Brown versus the Board of Education, and our children's education is still being determined by their zip code. Every day, almost 50 million Americans wake up and don't have health insurance. We have a lot of problems in this country we need to solve. Energy policy, we're in a war in Iraq in large part because our leaders haven't come up with a strategy to reduce our dependence on foreign oil. I believe change starts with ideas. 
and I very much look forward to sharing my ideas with you tonight. One idea I have is I started a reading program in Montgomery County where we're tutoring 700 children to improve their literacy skills. I look forward to sharing more of these kind of ideas. Thank you very much. I asked why the independent candidate Kevin Zeese wasn't here. I was told he wasn't invited. I think the sponsoring organizations need to ex explain that, why that happened to you and to Kevin. He adds an awful lot to the forums that I've been at. Uh, the reason I'm dressed like a beach bum and don't wear one of my $1,000 suits was because 13 months ago I was stabbed in the neck. I was unconscious for five, over five weeks. They didn't think I'd survive. I was hospitalized for five and a half months and lost 80 pounds. You see what you get. But I get a nice comfortable chair as a consolation prize. I'm running as a socialist in the Democratic primary, supporting the Democratic Party the way a rope supports a hanged man, because both parties are financed by that one half of a percent of American families which owns more wealth than 90 percent of all the rest of us put together. And that's why they don't represent us, they represent them. And that's why we have to unite that 90 percent, black, white, employed, unemployed, gay, straight, addicted, sober, because uh, we're the majority. As Shelley, my time up? My time's up. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I want to apologize. I think that yellow went a flip. We'll try to do a slightly better job. All right, um, now, we're now at the point of questions. Ron Walters has the first question. It's for Mr. Lichtman. Mr. Lichtman will have two minutes to respond. Then um, uh, Mr. Mfume, Mr. McCaskill um, um, uh, will then respond, and then we'll go to Mr. Lichtman for, and we're doing it that way because of the way this is set up here, and then Mr. Lichtman will go. Uh, to close. Ron Walters. Thank you very much. Mr. Lickman, in honor of the fact that the African American Democratic Club of Prince George's County is sponsoring this event, I'd like to lead off uh, and ask you how would you define African American interests and what steps would you take to protect them uh, should you be elected? Thank you very much. In one sense of cost, African-American interests are the same as all of our interests. We all benefit from good schools, jobs, getting off the fossil fuel economy, ending the war in Iraq and bringing the resources back home. But of course, because African-Americans have suffered a history of discrimination and an ongoing present day reality of discrimination, African-Americans also have some very special interests in America. If your senator can't help your community, then don't bother. So what can your senator do for the African American community? Number one, make sure that the Voting Rights Act is reauthorized and fully enforced. It's not being enforced by this administration. I know because I've been in 70 voting rights and civil rights cases, including many of the landmark cases across the United States. Number two, because so many African Americans are at the lower rungs of the income ladder, raise the minimum wage by at least 50 percent. Number three, fundamental reform of education so kids can get it to head start and get a leg up on their education so we can reduce class size, bring the best possible teachers into schools with African Americans, raise Pell Grants so African Americans can go to college and university. But you know what? A lot of this won't matter unless they're good jobs. The fastest growing segment of business today is African American business, but they're being neglected. That's why I have a plan to promote African American business, including a national capital fund, to funny money into minority businesses, which are undercapitalized, an education program so that African American businessmen can learn e-commerce and other techniques, enforce the anti-discrimination laws which are not being enforced today. Can we improve the lives of African Americans? We can by working together with courage, backbone, principle, and determination. If thank not you, now, thank, thank you when, if much, not Mr. in Walker. Maryland, where? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me, let me try to go to the heart of the question because I think the question is, is twofold. Uh, in many respects, African American issues are American issues. But there is a divergence based on statistics and the way those issues sometimes 
disproportionately affect African Americans. In health, the disparities in breast cancer, prostate cancer, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, hypertension, HIV, and full-blown AIDS are drastically different from the larger community. In the area of poverty, one out of six children in this country got up and went to bed tonight, or will go to bed tonight, living below the poverty level. That poverty hits harder, unfortunately, in many black communities. In terms of higher education, too many of our schools are overcrowded and ill-equipped in many of our black, poor, white, and poor Latino communities. And so there are disproportionate aspects of an overall economy that affects all of us. It is discrimination. It is the need to have minority business development within small business development. And it is the need to go beyond talking about, for many of us, the minimum wage and to start talking about a livable wage and a decent job and job creation because the unemployment rate in black Thank communities is currently twice the national average. Thank you very much. Mr. McCaffrey. Well, at the Naval Research Laboratory in 1973, I served collateral duty as an equal employment opportunity counselor so that African Americans and women would have an equal opportunity in the federal workplace. As United States Senator, I will work to fully restore the funds for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. The Bush administration has cut it by 20 percent. And I will work to do that and make sure that minority business enterprises have their fair share of the federal contracts. Mr. Cardin. I grew up in a community in which I faced discrimination as a religious minority. So I know how hurtful and how draining it is to a society. We live in the most successful, diversified society in the history of the world. But we can't be blinded to the fact that we have deep and troubling divides, and too much is based upon race. I believe that one person can make a difference, and I've tried to live my life by that motto. In the United States Congress, in the United States Senate, I'm going to fight to bring us together, to bring all communities together, to fight for the inequalities we have today in education, to make higher education affordable. It's one of the major problems that we're facing in, in our community, for economic opportunity for all communities, to fight for better economic growth, for social justice. We need to work to bring our communities together so that this great nation will offer its opportunity to all of its citizens. And we're not doing that today. All politics is local and all politics is comparative. As someone who's worked on civil rights and worked for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, I know rhetoric and vague hopes aren't enough. You've got to deliver the goods right to the community. You heard a lot of vague hopes near the candidates. You heard specific plans from me on wages, on education, on minority businesses. If your senator can't deliver for you, it doesn't matter. I promise to deliver. I've given you the specific ideas. I ask for your support. Thank you very much. Williams. This question is for Mr. Mfume. Mr. Mfume, you spoke about race as an issue in this campaign and education. How would you propose to help with the achievement gap between black and white students in this county and elsewhere and the horrific dropout rate among African-American students? First of all, as someone who unfortunately had to drop out of high school, after my mother's death when I was 16, I know what it's like when a society gives up on you and believes that nothing will come of that person. The first thing that we have to do as a society, I think, is to try to redeem those young men and women who unfortunately are out of school and are out of school before they graduated. When you talk about this gap and finding a way to close it with respect to public education K through 12, we have to acknowledge there's a problem. I think that's the first step. And too often times the government doesn't do that. We don't want to support good teachers. We don't want to deal with retention and recruitment. We don't want to try to find a way to increase facilities. We don't want to talk about concentrating efforts. We don't want to talk about bringing in the private sector. We just assume that it will take care of itself and it won't. We've got some of the best schools in, this, in, in, the, in America right here in this state, but we also have some of the worst. And in some of those schools, drugs are more available than textbooks. 
And young people, because of their age or size these days, get of uh, some sort of special system. We've got to find a way, I think, to rely on the things that work and to bring values back into the system, to involve parents back into the system, and to support teachers and, and support those extra personnel that are there who are professionals who support teachers in their activities day in and day out. As a member of the Institute of Navigation, I've already worked on a committee which has brought GPS demonstrations into one of the high schools in Maryland. I will, as a United States Senator, I will work to bring GPS and other scientific modules into the Maryland school system for African Americans and all of the students of the state of Maryland. I'm a product of the Baltimore public school system. So I know how important public education is to, in the answer of the question that's been posed. First, it starts with the federal government truly making education a priority and being partnered with our local jurisdictions. No Child Left Behind has micromanaged the system and has not funded its share of the federal partnership. We need to fully fund No Child Left Behind. And we should certainly allow the locals the opportunity to determine their own standards. We shouldn't be micromanaging that nationally. I've introduced legislation which is known as the Master Teachers Bill that tells us that our best teachers we would put in our lower performing schools and provide incentives, financial incentives for those teachers so that those that are at the greatest risk have the best teachers because when it comes to education the teachers are the critical ingredient and we should be putting our best where the challenges are the greatest. Mr. Rail. I wrote a plan that you can read at railsforsenate.org that addresses this very issue of the achievement gap. No Child Left Behind mandated that we have a highly qualified teacher in every classroom by the end of this past school year. Unfortunately, right here in Prince George's County, only six out of ten teachers were deemed highly qualified. The only way we're ever going to change this is to attract the best and brightest teachers into our schools that are led by great principals. And we're going to have to pay them substantially more. That's the reality in the 21st century. The bottom line, though, is we have to hold our teachers and principals accountable once we pay them more. And I outline in my plan just how we do that, including make sure, making sure they pass a rigorous national competency exam in the subject they're teaching. That's very important. What all the research shows, ladies and gentlemen, is that if our children who come from disadvantaged backgrounds have access to great teachers, they can learn at a very satisfactory rate. The time has come to change this. That's why I wrote a plan. Thank you. Do you want a 30-second response? Yeah, I, I would appreciate the opportunity to respond, and I thank you very much. We're going to be measured by and large by what we do and not what we say. And the reason many of us sit here today is because people before us who didn't always have the ways or the means, who were black and white and Latino, who were immigrants in some instances, who were city dwellers and who were on farms, believed that if we just got an education, we would become buoyed. If we just got an education, we could make this a better nation. And in their own way, with meager means, they laid down and made their bodies bridges in every generation that we could run across and get to this university and have debates like this. It is now our responsibility to do that for children who are in school and for those yet unborn by insisting, Thank you, Mr. By insisting Mr. on equal opportunity for all children Thank in our educational system. Thank you very much. Thank those you. responses are 30 seconds, gentlemen, and we we'll try to keep to that. Um, our next question is from Professor Ron Walters, and it's for Mr. McCaskill. Ron? Uh, Mr. McCaskill, uh, like um, in the country, the state of Maryland, crime uh, has continued to slow, but uh, the incarceration rate has uh, continued to grow. Uh, one wonders um, well, how it is that you would, uh, if you were elected, uh, deal with the question of uh, the growth of incarceration. Uh, would it be more policing or other kinds of measures? I'd first like to address and expand under homeland security. We already have a capital airspace 
Enforcement Act, which covers a 16-mile radius, and it covers not only the district, Prince George's County, Montgomery County, we've got an epidemic of homicides there. What I'd like to do is cut down on the homicides by expanding homeland security in that 16-mile radius to make the nation's capital the safest one, the safest capital in the world. I think that we can do it, and I think that we'd have more officers, whatever it took, but it would also bring great economic benefits, which would bring hope to African Americans and to other people in the state of Maryland if we could just end that epidemic of homicides that we have in our nation's capitals right now. We passed last night in the House of Representatives a bill that provided special federal assistance to the National Capital Park region for transportation. Why do I mention that with crime? I think the federal government needs to do more as a partner in dealing with the metropolitan Washington area. Crime knows no boundary, and the particular problems we're having in Prince George's County and Montgomery County, in many cases, involve the nation's capital, and the federal government should be a more aggressive player dealing with gang issues, auto theft, and related issues. On the national level, it's a matter of budget priority. Most of the criminal justice activities occur at the state and local level, but the federal government needs to be a partner again. And where are our priorities? Our priorities have been with tax cuts. Our priority has been in funding a war. Our priority should be in our own communities, in funding programs to help young people, to provide after-school programs, to provide the type of tutoring during critical hours of the day. That's where our priorities need to be. We need to change the direction in Washington. It's almost unfathomable to me how we deal with this issue. In the state of Maryland, half of all ex-offenders are back in jail within three years. One of the things that we could do is develop the re-entry partnerships that have already started that are in a couple of our prisons already, where we create a social network to help ex-offenders get out, to get housing, to get jobs, and, and to be effective citizens. It's very, very difficult to uh, commit a crime, go to jail, and get out, and get reoriented into society. Last year in the Congress, the Second Chance Act of 2005 was introduced but not passed. It would have brought $100 million to localities to provide funds. The other thing is three-quarters of all crimes are related to drug offenses. We need to substantially increase money for drug treatment so that we can help people recover and be effective citizens rather than keep committing crimes. Four dollars is what it costs for every dollar that we, we, that we don't spend on drug treatment. We can make a lot of progress if we do that. Thank you. Mr. Kaplan. We shouldn't be driving people to drugs in the first instance. If we had national health insurance, people wouldn't have to medicate themselves. If we had a federal jobs program because private enterprise will not hire a huge portion of people who have not been properly trained by our rotten schools, we need what we had in the 30s, the Works Projects Administration, the Civilian Conservation Corps camps, for everybody that wants work, regardless of age or anything else. Do the work that's needed in the community and get the job training that's needed in the community so we don't waste all that human power. Uh, we should not stop felons or prisoners from voting. They vote in England and in Europe, and we, this is part of the democratic process. Uh, the, uh, we should treat drug addiction as we do any other sickness, not as a criminal thing in which we can throw people in jail. We have a larger proportion and an absolute number of people in prison in this country than in any time in history or at any other country in the entire world. And we need to make free education in colleges and graduate schools the same as it is from K through 12. Uh, and what's going to make that happen is people organizing class struggle protests, as so many young black people were doing in the 60s. Mr. Kaplan, thank, thank you, you very you. much. Mr. McCaskill, you get 30 seconds response. On the crime and homicide issue, I was certainly pleased to see Congressman Cardin recognize that as an issue. I'm sure we all do. I live in Prince George's <laughs> County. There's one phrase that President Bush has I agree with. If you like this, sir, do it now. Don't wait till 2007. Expand the Capital Airspace Enforcement Act to include the ground space as well to bring less homicides to the nation's capital. Thank you very much. Juan Williams, your question. And it's for Mr. Carter. Uh, Cardin. 
Mr. Cardin, you mentioned in your opening statement that you voted against uh, giving the President the right to use force in Iraq. What position do you take with regard to the ongoing warfare between Israel and uh, Hezbollah and Hamas now uh, in the Middle East? Thank you. Well, you are correct. I did vote against the war in Iraq four years ago. The current situation in the Middle East, I think, reflects somewhat the fact that we've lost our focus in America on the war against terror in the Middle East. Our focus should not have been on Iraq. There are more dangerous countries, including Iran and Syria. And yet our focus was on Iraq, which was not a danger to this country, it was not involved in the attack on our country on September the 11th. The current situation in the Middle East is extremely serious. Israel has every right to defend itself. It has every right to root out the Hezbollah organization, which is aimed at creating terrorist activities within Israel, jeopardizing the security of Israel. So Israel has every right to defend itself, has every right to do what it's doing in an effort to make sure the Hezbollah cannot be funded and continue its efforts against uh, the, the country of Israel itself. Now, what the United States should be doing is using its relationships internationally so that we can do develop the type of international support to root out the terrorist activities that are being supported by Syria and Iran and Lebanon. Lebanon's an innocent country. They are not capable of defending their own country or what's happening in their own country. And it's tragic what's happening there now. So we do need the help of the international community to get the Hezbollah out of Lebanon and stop the international funding. One last point. We're the only major company, country that is designated the Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. We need to work with the international community to cut off the international funding for the Hezbollah, the terrorist organization. Since last week, over 700 rockets were fired at civilians in Israel, and over 23 Israelis have been killed, most of them civilians. Israel is like any other country that is now defending itself. Uh, Hezbollah is a terrorist organization that is being uh, fueled by Iran and by Syria. I support resolution, UN Resolution 1559, which calls for the Lebanese government to deploy forces in the southern part of Lebanon to prevent the Hezbollah from launching further rockets. I think that's very, very important. It also calls for disarming Hezbollah. I don't agree with Congressman Cardin that Lebanon is an innocent country. The Hezbollah is very influential in the Lebanese government, and it's very, very important for the Lebanese government to step up and stop them and disarm them, just as the UN Resolution 1559 says. It's a very unfortunate situation, and every effort should be uh, taken to avoid civilian casualties. Ben Cardin may have voted against the war two years ago, but he voted to finance the war when, when Bush asked him for it. And I find that inexcusable and unforgivable. Israel, that's, that's not going to, the situation's not going to change until Israel pulls out really, honestly, out of the West Bank entirely instead of putting more settlers there and having roads that only, that only Israeli citizens can ride in. Uh, the Palestinians have a legitimate complaint. They're willing to accept a two-state solution. Israel gives voice to being willing to accept a two-state solution, but it sabotages it every day by keeping their population in the West Bank. All they have to do is just get out and things will begin to settle down. Until that happens, Jews and Arabs will keep killing each other, as tragic as that is. I have a pamphlet out there I have to pull out for cost $2 on the real history of, of, of Zionism. There's a reason why Israel is the largest recipient of, of, of aid from the United States of any country in the world, and Egypt the second largest. I, I'm going to move you just a little bit over. Okay. <laughs> Visible line there. <laughs> you, the voters, need to know that Mr. Cardin's record on the war has changed fundamentally. He's not only voted to fund the war, but just last year, with the chips on the line, and before the polls turned, he voted against an amendment simply calling on the president to develop a plan to withdraw the troops from Iraq, and he voted for the House Republican resolution, giving the president, in effect, leave to stay in Iraq 
indefinitely. With respect to Israel's attacks on the Hezbollah, of course Israel has a right to defend itself, but it has done so decisively, and the destruction of Lebanon will do the world no good. It will only breed more terrorism. Therefore, I ask Mr. Cardin and every other candidate here to join with me, as I asked them yesterday, to ask and demand that President Bush call for a ceasefire in the Middle East to prevent a wider war, to prevent a possible world, world war, and let for once diplomacy do its work. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing today, my friends? Okay. Mr. Cardin, you get 30 seconds. Yeah. My record's clear on the war in Iraq, and I ask you all to judge me on it. I've opposed the war from the beginning. I've been an outspoken critic of the president ever since the beginning of the war at every turn, and have called on a plan to bring our troops home. But let me get to the question in the rebuttal. And that is, I remember when Bill Clinton was president of the United States, and America was respected internationally, and we really had impact on being able to mold world opinion. We paid a heavy price because of George Bush's international mistakes. And it's limiting our option today. We gotta to take back the House and Senate this year and the White House in two years. Ron Walters, a question for Mr. Rails. Mr. Rails, Prince George's County, Maryland is um, probably the most affluent uh, county in the United States that is dominated by African Americans. But they don't dominate the economic system. And I'm wondering, uh, if you were elected, how would you foster fair economic growth uh, in Prince George's County and in the state of Maryland? Well, let me first of all say that I have a, a lot of experience in Prince George's County. Uh, my business has been primarily based here, buying and fixing up undermanaged, undermaintained apartment communities all over the county. And we started in the early 80s when it wasn't so fashionable. Now, in the last few years, my IQ's gone up 30 points with the real estate market, and everybody wants to start redeveloping here. But one of the very specific things we could do is bring Prince George's County uh, its fair share of federal uh, office space and federal employment. Right now, uh, only 2 million square feet of federal office spaces in Prince George's County compared to 8 million square feet in Montgomery and 18 million in Northern Virginia. And there are a lot of metro stops that are underdeveloped where we could bring in a lot of uh, contracting work that would be uh, given primarily to uh, people here in Prince George's County where we can do development and make the community more affluent in that respect. Uh, with National Harbor coming in, with the Wegmans locating here, you're seeing finally some recognition that Prince George's County uh, has the uh, financial capability to attract uh, a lot of this business. Uh, having been uh, a business person here in Prince George's County, I will be a strong advocate uh, of business coming in here. And I will be able to point to my own personal financial success uh, to, to justify why people should locate here, how we can help improve things. But the last point is that we've got to get uh, a handle around our schools. The new superintendent coming here is a positive step. But attracting the best and the brightest teachers into the school systems will improve them. And business traditionally locates where there are excellent schools. And with only six out of ten highly qualified teachers, we have a lot of room for improvement. If we can change that, we can bring a lot more business in and help Prince George's County. Thank you. Mr. Cardin danced around, but he didn't reply to what Alan Lickman and myself said. Alan Lickman uh, w would have been more gentlemanly to have uh, announced which of the candidates have told him to add their name to his uh, proposal. I think the way most people in the black or white community uh, look at solving the unemployment and underemployment and poverty problems in the his, uh, black and Hispanic communities by getting business to, to do something, business ain't going to do anything. The biggest economic advance that African Americans made was during World War II with war construction and black peasant families moved up north to get good union jobs and they were able to send their children to college. We need to do something similar to that only building the housing and the, and the public transportation and the health facilities that this country needs and put everybody to work doing that. 
That's the way discrimination against blacks is going to finally come close to an end. Thank you. I'm the only candidate in this race to have drafted a compact with Prince George's County. Do I have a minute? <laughs> Can I start again? <laughs> I am the only candidate in this race to have drafted a compact with Prince George's County. You can find it on the front page of my website, alanlichtman.com. It's the promises I made to work with people in gorgeous Prince George's to try to improve your communities. What have I promised with respect to economic development? To work on the problem of programs of enterprise zones, to make investment more attractive, to give loans and aid to small businesses, the great engine of opportunity and growth in Prince George's County. You already heard my plan for minority businesses. I would work with local communities to support revitalization efforts like that which I visited firsthand that's going on in the ports towns right here in Prince George's County. And because this is so important, you heard my plan in education, and I would also work with you to make your community safe by increasing federal law enforcement assistance right to local police forces and to improve your ecology and make sure you don't get dangerous facilities like the liquefied natural gas plant that they're unwisely proposing for Hyattsville. Thank you. Well, I think there are a couple of things that we ought to just put on the table. Economic development, going back to the heart of the question, has to be the engine that drives the opportunities in Prince George's County and other counties where there are significant populations that are not always sharing from the circular flow of income that exists there. We need to make sure that we protect set-asides, which has become a dirty word in the minds of some people, but it is still a process to ensure that women and minorities have an opportunity to compete. We've got to find a way to make sure that there is job location. I mentioned earlier about the high jobless rate that exists in many of these communities. We've got to fight against predatory lending that takes advantages of those persons who are trying to develop opportunities. We've got to fight against union busting, which tears apart those same communities and doesn't prevent or allow for a real growth in disposable income. And for minority businesses, we've got to just stop worrying about the problem and be creative enough to go out and to create secondary markets so they'll have the opportunity to tap the capital, to expand, to create jobs, to employ people. We need a circular flow of income in this county and other counties around this state in order for people to feel like they're part of the economic boom. With the absence of that, what Thank we find in many instances are people who live in places Thank that you, are Mr. very Informant. wealthy that have no wealth of their own. Thank you very much. Thank I, you very much. Uh, excuse me, we think maybe your cell phone is on. I don't have a cell phone. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Eric, sorry. Um, I think we're at Mr. Rails, is that right? One of the things I'd like to add is that 20% uh, of all businesses in Maryland are minority businesses, but, but it's difficult to expand when your social network is limited or, and when you have limited access to capital. That's why we have the, the Small Business Administration 8A program. President Bush has cut that back significantly. I look forward as your senator to doing a lot of arm twisting to get that program back up and running the way it needs to be and break up federal contracts that are too big for small businesses here in Prince George's so that they can participate in all the procurement dollars that we have here. Thank you. Uh, Juan Williams, a, a question for Mr. Kaufman. Mr. Kaufman, do you have any differences with the comprehensive immigration plan that is now pending in the U.S. Congress? Yes. Neither plan takes into account the needs of the immigrants. Nobody asks why all these people are crossing the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Rio Grande next question. to try to get jobs in this country. They're doing it because our foreign policy has made it impossible to ache out a living on the peasant farms in Mexico and Central America. And our government has supported repressive regimes 
in Nicaragua and El Salvador and Guatemala that's killed hundreds of thousands of their people. The only way they can make a living is to try to get into this country that made it impossible to make a living in their own countries. We need a foreign policy that looks at third world people as people we want to help rather than the people we want to squeeze the lifeblood out of. We need a foreign policy that reflects the golden rule, not the rule of gold and the rule of oil. And until we do that, people will come to this country for the same reason that people fled Nazi Germany. And unfortunately, we're beginning to treat them the way the United States and Switzerland treated Jews trying to escape from Germany. That ship that had a thousand Jews on it right before World War II that came to the United States, we wouldn't let them land. They were shipped back to Germany to die in the concentration camps. They made a movie about it, about it, I forgot what it's called. And when they tried to get into Switzerland, they were turned back to the Nazi authorities to be murdered. We're doing something similar to sending them back to starve to death in Mexico and for their children to starve to death or die of illnesses in which there are easy solutions to. We're the cause of it. We have to be the solution to it. Thank you. Mr. Lickman. This is a question that means a great deal to me as a second generation American who grew up on the tough streets of Brooklyn, New York, if you remember the old TV show, Cotter Country, surrounded by immigrants and the children and grandchildren of immigrants. What do I propose? Number one, we must reject the punitive Republican approach that would turn 12 million undocumented immigrants into criminals and doctors and clergymen and teachers to help them. Number two, we must have a rigorous six-year program to regularize people's status, not to jump ahead of anyone, but to go through a tough process, pay your taxes, learn English. Most importantly, though, we cannot go it alone. We need a North American partnership. You could put fire-breathing dragons on the border, and it won't stop the flow unless you begin to close the economic gap between the United States and Mexico, just as they did with some of the countries in Europe. The only way to do that is a comprehensive partnership on immigration and homeland security between the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. Thank it's a new you. idea you I hope you'll much. consider. Thank you very much. I support the Kennedy-McCain bill. I think there's still more work to be done with it. I'm glad that it is a bill that creates pathways to citizenship. I'm glad it's a bill that insists that English is, in fact, the language that we encourage people to learn. I'm glad it is a bill that does not jump people ahead of other people who've been standing in line waiting to become citizens and doing all the right things. But we can still do more. The worst thing was the bill that preceded that, the Sensenbrenner bill which would have built a 700-mile wall around our southern borders and made it a felony, a felony, if you or a priest or a teacher or a health care worker helped an undocumented worker. And they call it undocumented presence. And I don't know what that is except Dick Cheney on a firing range without papers. But it is not what we ought to do to American citizens. We've got to find a way to deal with, as Bob Kaufman said, our bad trade policies that contribute to this rush of immigration, our bad human rights policies that we sort of put up and go along with throughout this hemisphere, and then we expect for some reason or another that people don't want to come here. Well, they do want to come here because they still believe that this is the country where they can succeed. We need a policy you, that Mr. is just, that's fair, and that's brokered by immigrants and non-immigrants alike. Part of the problem is economic. I think we can help stem that problem with health care. I like health care for all Americans, do it in such a way it brings the beginning of health care for the entire world. What I want to do is put a health care incentive onto the products that come from Mexico, like Mexican salsa. If it costs a dollar, it costs a dollar and ten cents. If you get Canadian salsa, it only costs a dollar because they have health care. Canada has it, Mexico doesn't have it. Now, suppose Mexico says, hey, I can have health care cheaper in Mexico. Then if they provide health care, I've started the beginning of health care in Mexico. And once we do that, we're going to extend it for every product that Walmart imports to bring health care for all Americans and to begin of health care for the entire world. Mr. Kaufman, we're back to you. 
I 30 forgot, seconds. I 30 forgot seconds. you were going to come back to me. I haven't figured out what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, the, the, the wall that we're building. I'm for building a wall. But I'm for building a wall on the northern part of Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, <laughs> California, <laughs> Nevada, and parts of a few other states. That's Mexican land that we stole from them in the Mexican War. <laughs> In, in, order, in order to expand slavery, because the Mexicans, being obviously inferior people... Thank you, Mr. Kaplan. ...have put Kaplan. an end to slavery. <laughs> okay, here we switch a little bit, and we're going to go back to Juan Williams to ask the next question, because... We didn't want the same questioner asking the same candidate. So um, Ron Walters asked the first question to Mr. Lickman. Now the next question will be from Juan Williams to Mr. Lickman. But it won't be Mr. Infumi, Mr. McCaskill, and Mr. Cardin will jump three. So it'll be Mr. Lickman, Mr. Rails, and if I hope I get this right, if not, you guys can correct me, Mr. Kaplan. And back to Mr. Infume, Kaufman. Kaufman, excuse me, and then back to Mr. Lickman. To get it well, yeah, we'll do it. And the sole reason we want you to know is so that everybody gets a chance to talk to everybody else. On that note, Juan Williams. Mr. Lickman, would you vote to extend the president's tax cuts? Not only would I not vote to extend the president tax cuts that affect only primarily those who don't need it in the upper income brackets, I would fundamentally reform our tax system and our systems of allocation in this country in order to bring the deficit under control so we're not piling burdens of debt on my 14-year-old son, on your children and your grandchildren. What would I do? First of all, the administration says the rich pay the taxes, right? So the rich have to get the tax cuts. Wrong! What doesn't that take into account the fact that two-thirds of us today pay more in payroll taxes than we do in income taxes, and payroll taxes are the most regressive taxes we have. So what do we do that can, in a way that can both fund Social Security and make taxes more equitable. You lift the cap on Social Security taxes so the rich start to pay their fair share and you exempt the first 10 or 20,000 in income so lo and behold the tax becomes progressive. Number two, don't eradicate the estate tax. Have a reasonable estate tax with a five million dollar exemption for family farms and businesses and you could net 40 to 50 billion dollars a year. Deficit starting to come down. Money for real needs in health care and jobs. Stop subsidizing the big agricultural corporations. Stop subsidizing Exxon under the energy bill. End the war in Iraq which ultimately is going to cost us 1.3 trillion dollars and like the money spent on Vietnam, it's going to go poof, and you're going to have no idea where it went. With that kind of real fiscal program, we can have tax equity, we can bring the deficit under control, and yes, we can have things like decent schools, single-payer health care, and job programs in this country. Thank That's you what very it's going much. to take. Mr. Reyes. Juan, I wouldn't extend the Bush tax cuts in the top three brackets uh, or in capital gains uh, or for dividends. Uh, and it's for two reasons. And we're in a Democratic primary, so the answer is pretty uh, expected. But we have to sell all of the American people. And the two reasons I wouldn't do it is we need to restore fiscal responsibility because we have a moral obligation to our children not to pass along million, trillions of dollars of debt. To, to them and to, and to future generations. We also have a responsibility to preserve the social safety net that we've worked so hard to build up. And if the interest keeps piling up, we're not going to be able to do that. But the other reason that I wouldn't extend the Bush tax cuts in those areas is because uh, of the concentration of wealth that's occurred in the last several decades. In the 70s, the top 1% earned 7% of the national income. Now the top 1% earns 14% of the national income. So I think we have to appeal to our nation's fairness. 
why we need to do this, and that we should be willing to carry a little more water in the higher end for the betterment of our society. Thank you. I would cut practically all taxes, hidden and otherwise, for 80 to 90 percent of the American people, particularly that 90 percent who own less wealth than the one half percent at the top. Tax them, and perhaps the other half of a percent, and perhaps in a progressively smaller amount, the rest of that 9 percent. Uh, and if we did that and cut the military spending, we would have enough to live in a land of milk and honey for all of us in this country and for the rest of the world, too, within 10 years. Uh, we have the technology to do that now. That we don't do it, it's criminal injustice. It's, and that's pretty much it. Thank you. I'm trying to keep track. It's Mr. Mpumbia. Yeah, I, I would vote against extending the tax cuts, and I would vote against doing away with the estate tax and all these other uh, shenanigans. And let me tell you why. Very simple. Until the president is prepared to recognize and to see what life looks like from the side of the street he is not on, where other people live every day, we ought not even have a debate about that. That really ought not be a challenge. The president, the last time I looked, still lived in subsidized housing, the White House. <laughs> he still got free food. He got free health insurance that we have to pay for, free dental care. He got free security, and he got free transportation. So until he understands what it's like and the others who support him to not even have a salary to tax, we ought not have but one discussion, and that's to try to find a way to bring sanity back to the White House by getting him out and getting all those out who don't recognize how tough it is for everyday people. Mr. Lickman. Of course, it's easy to poke fun at George Bush. That's not going to do anything for you in your communities. What we really need is what Franklin Roosevelt said, to make government work again for the forgotten men and women, which today are not just the less affluent, but the middle class. That's why I propose fundamental tax reform and fundamental reallocation of priorities. It's going to take root and branch change to do that office holders and former office holders aren't going to do it for you. Let's vote for someone with a passion and conviction for real change Thank you and hopefully much. a record you can count on. Thank you very much. Ron Walters, a question for Mr. Mfumi. Mr. Mfumi, a number of your colleagues this evening have talked about the importance of uh, education. But a few years ago, uh, the state legislature passed something called the Thornton Plan which was an educational financing scheme, which hasn't been funded. Uh, how would you use your leverage uh, to get it moving? Good question. Let me just say it, it is all right to poke fun at the president. He pokes fun at us every day. He pokes fun at us every day through his policies and through his practices and through what he doesn't do. But let me say this also. This, this notion about fully funding education that ought to be one of the defining issues of this campaign. The Thornton Report, which was never fully funded, people said, oh, it's a great bill and we'll do this and we'll do that. And when everyone turned away, those who had the power to do it didn't do it. And Delegate Patterson and others will tell you what that fight was like down in Annapolis. We've got to find a way on the federal level to substantially bring pressure to the state government through withholding things and causing the process to slow down until the state government is prepared to yield. There ought to be a give and a take and a quid pro quo. But right now, I don't necessarily see that. I think whatever the state government wants, the administration wants from the federal level, we're quick as elected officials, some of us, to go and do that. But we're not always quick to say these are the things that we want. And fully funding the Thornton Report clearly ought to be one of them. I continue to say over and over again, unless we create an educational system where there is opportunity for every child, regardless of their race, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their religion, we continue to fight the same battles generation after generation. And I'm convinced if we start making the real fight there, the real fight, education and public education, and indeed higher education, 
then we'll have a better enlightened society, we'll create opportunities, we'll create jobs, and we will give real reason for people to hope. In the absence of that, we'll continue to see measures that come forward by very thoughtful persons like Mr. Thornton, who have the best wishes of others, parents and teachers and students, that left are left a lie that never get fully funded and that remain things that we talk about in debates such as this. We've got to find a way to insist that our elected officials do just that. And I believe that. And I want you to hold them accountable. All of us. I'm going to hold accountable. you accountable. Time up. <laughs> <laughs> and I know the temptation with a, a wireless mic, and there are a number of you. Please remember those invisible lines if you can. Um, okay, uh, Mr. Kaufman. I was making notes when you were saying, asking the question. What was the question, please? Sorry. Well, first of it was, try to stay, let's have those invisible lines so that no one stands in front of another candidate. Just a little, if you don't mind. You don't mind moving to the left a little, do you? <laughs> you got it. <laughs> you got it. And, and what was the question? I'm Go sorry. Ahead. What was the question? This is a continuing question about education, I believe. Yes, how would you foster implementation of the Thornton plan? Uh, simple, you tax the rich to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> is there any reason why uh, education, even as poor as it is, is free from K through 12th grade, but isn't free for college or graduate school? In Cuba, it's free for college and graduate school. Uh, if they can do it, why can't we? All we have to do, if, 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 from, from uh, pre-K through the 12th grade, we have to put in enough money to, to make it happen. And the schools should be run not by political appointees, but the school board should be composed of parents, teachers, students, and others, others who work for the school system. And they should run the schools because they're the ones that have the deepest interest in making the schools work, not politicians. Until that happens, we're going to continue to have problems in that area. Thank you. Mr. Lichtman. And so then what can it will the be, I'm sorry, and then it will be Mr. Rails. I know it's difficult to keep track of it. <laughs> so what can the federal government do to help the Thornton plan, which is a state plan? Number one, as your U.S. Senator, I would fight to make education a basic civil right in this country and implement the idea that there should be no disparities in funding in education based upon where you live. Everyone should have an equal opportunity to education. Number two, we can fully fund Title I. Our state is being shortchanged $150 million that goes to the most disadvantaged schools. In addition, it's not just a matter of money. Perhaps the best thing the federal government can do to help our schools is to unshackle our great teachers from being forced to teach to the test under no child left behind. Let's unleash the creativity of our great teachers. Let them respond to the needs of individual students. Let our teachers teach and fully fund their education programs. Make education a civil right. That's what your senator can do. Thank you very much. When the Thornton plan was first passed, however noble the objective, there was no funding source that was provided at the time that it was passed. And then Maryland went into a recession. We went, got it into a lot of different problems, and it hasn't been fully funded since. I'm a big believer that this is a great idea, and if something's a great idea, it's worth paying for. So we have to work together to figure out a way to pay for programs as important as Thornton. We live in a world, ladies and gentlemen, where we have three billion new capitalists since the fall of the Berlin Wall. If the kids in this country aren't given the crucial skills at the outset so that they can compete in today's global economy, they're going to fall behind. This is a top priority. That's why I wrote an education plan to have the federal government step in and help kids that come from disadvantaged backgrounds that grow up in poverty so that they can get great teachers. So I'm going to wrap my arms around the people at the state level and tell them we got to make this happen. We can't allow failure to continue anymore. We got to help these children be successful. Thank you. Mr. Mm -hmm. Infumi, 30 seconds. Well, I just want to reiterate and be deliberately redundant about one thing. 
Education is a right. It must never be seen as a privilege. And it must always be one of our foremost priorities as a nation. Because when we do that, we solve half of our problems in the process. But when we have two-tiered levels of education, or where we don't have opportunity, or where we allow discrimination and racism and everything else to play a role in terms of who gets good schools and who gets good teachers and where are they located and who gets a gifted and talented program and who gets nothing, then we in the process throw off a great opportunity to start solving the problems Thank that we are going much. to live with every day of our lives. There is no substitute for good quality education. None. The next question is from Juan Williams and it's from Mr. McCaskill. Mr. McCaskill, if you were in the U.S. Senate, would you vote to override a presidential veto that would allow a, a bill for federal funding for stem cell research? Yes, I would very definitely vote to override it. The very goal of the stem cell research is to help those of us that are alive today with problems like diabetes and Parkinson's disease. And we have an ideological president and administration which has made their own interpretation and which is based on that interpretation has tried to restrict these modern miracles that many of the researchers, and I very definitely believe that we should go ahead in a very careful manner that's approved by the medical community. And so I would very definitely vote to overturn it and would keep working even if he did overturn it. Thank you. This will be, we're going to go now to Mr. Lickman, Mr. Mfume, and Mr. Cardin. This question is very personal for me in two ways. Number one, as a lifetime educator, I've dedicated myself to research to teaching, to the advancement of knowledge. And it truly pains me to see a president who is blocking and stymieing research and knowledge, particularly when it comes in an area that could be so important in relieving human suffering and distress, and when the bill provides for the sensibilities of those who are worried about its ethical implications by dealing only with embryos that would be discarded. Secondly, it's particularly poignant to me because I'm a cancer survivor. I'm blessed by each and every day, and I know how important stem cell research can be for people who suffer from debilitating, life-threatening kinds of diseases. It can mean life for some, it can mean a new and vibrant life for the others, and I would speak out for stem cell research and resoundingly vote to override a presidential veto. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Yeah, I think you probably will probably find unanimity here tonight on this question. When you look at the eyes of people who can't walk because of spinal injuries or those who suffer from MS and those who have all sorts of pain and illness, you have to ask yourself, if not now, when? We're not God. And we don't try to play God. But God gave us a brain to try to find a way to work through problems on this earth. And the research that's taking place and the life-saving measures that are taking place have come about as a result of that. We have a real opportunity to help people, a real opportunity to relieve some of the suffering that families have to deal with as they continue to take care of people who are real, uh, rehabilitating, and a real opportunity to give people a chance to do something different, and that is to have a life again and have an opportunity, because we never know when that individual might in fact be us, through an accident or something else. I think if we fail to take advantage of this revolutionary technology with proper ethical guidelines, then we would have missed a great opportunity to serve all kinds of people, many of whom we will never know, Thank all of whom would be thankful. Thank you very much. Thank I'm you. thankful. Mr. Cardin. I'm an original co-sponsor of the bill that the president is likely to veto today or tomorrow, and I will vote for the override, as I've already indicated, tomorrow. The bill has the appropriate safeguards in it. 
The bill is absolutely necessary. Government is interfering with appropriate scientific research. This president in 2001 put arbitrary restrictions on embryonic stem cell research, and it's hurting us. Today I was with a young man who had a spinal cord injury, Josh, who hopes one day to be able to walk again, but he wants to be met halfway. He's doing his work to keep himself as healthy as possible, but he wants our scientists to be able to give him hope by embryonic stem cell research. It's also against our economic interest. We are one of the hubs at Johns Hopkins University, NIH, University of Maryland Medical Center, and we're telling them they can't do embryonic stem cell research? That's ridiculous. We're losing our scientists to other countries. And lastly, I've taken on the Lieutenant Governor, Michael Steele, on this issue. It makes a huge difference who we elect to the United States Senate. We need to make sure that we keep that vote in the United States Senate for embryonic stem cell research. I would like to add to it is that belief in God implies belief in miracles. And God works through us to do his will. And here it is, we're working to bring the end of disease. And our president is trying to prohibit it. I definitely would, would vote to overturn that. And I back stem cell research. No, that's it. Yes, next question. Uh, <laughs> ahead, of, ahead of me already. Uh, Ron, a question for Mr. Cardin. Okay. Mr. Cardin, uh, David Catania of the District of Columbia uh, City Council uh, says that people are coming across the border uh, utilizing health care facilities in the district uh, from Maryland. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the head of the uh, Maryland State Health Care uh, Division says, no, uh, we're actually funding our priorities pretty good. What is the real deal here? What is the state of health care funding in the state of Maryland? And what kind of priorities should be addressed to it? Let me answer the question specifically first, and that is, we have a large problem of uncompensated care. It's been made more difficult, particularly for Prince George's County Dimensions and Prince George's County Hospital, as a result of the closure of a hospital in the district. We're getting more uncompensated care now into Prince George's County. Uh, as a result of the closure of that hospital, it will not be reopened for a couple more years. The federal government has a responsibility to help us with uncompensated care. I'm working with Albert Wynn right now on efforts to get the federal government more actively involved with Prince George's County Hospital. So we're, we have problems because of our location, and the nation's capital needs to do a better job. But let me just emphasize the issue on health care. We have 46 million Americans without any health insurance. That's the problem. This nation should have every person insured. We need universal health insurance. It's in our, ec it's in our health interest. It's also in our economic interest. We need to deal with the problems of our health care system. It's in crisis. It's in crisis. We need to drive down the cost of prescription drugs. I've introduced legislation so we can take on the pharmaceutical industry to get fair price. We should be paying one half the Canadian price for medicines because we have twice the market in the Medicare system. We need a more enlightened long-term care policy in America. We shouldn't force seniors to have to go into nursing homes because government pays the bill. We should be able to have more assisted living and home health services. We need to take on the health care crisis in America. It will not only help us deal with our budget deficit because we're wasting hundreds of billions of dollars a year in unnecessary health care costs, it will allow us to get greater access to health care for all people in this country. We have the highest quality health care in the world. The problem is too many people aren't receiving it. Congress needs to take action for universal coverage, taking on the prescription drug issue by the legislation I've introduced and deal with the long-term care. If we did this, we would have a much better system, and then the residents of the district wouldn't have to come over into Maryland. Mr. Infuna. Well, let me just say this. Of course we need universal health care. We need a single-payer system. And I asked my colleague to join me in advocating for a single-payer system where the government pays it. It's what businesses want because it relieves them of an inordinate debt. Physicians have said it is the best thing to do. 
Those of us who have to take advantage of the system recognize over and over again how much of a relief it would be on us. It would get the pharmaceuticals and all the big money out of politics that continue to donate to campaigns, and it would answer the question. It wouldn't be a matter of whether or not you came from the District of Columbia to Maryland or Maryland back. Everybody would have the same type of coverage. We'd have a patient's bill of rights where there would be real choice in the system. And we'd have an opportunity where decisions would be made by real professionals, not some bureaucrat at an HMO who doesn't know you, your pain, your problem, or anything else. It's a single payer system that we need. And if we spent just half less of what we're spending in Iraq right now, we could fully fund that. Mr. McCaskill. The state, we have a lot of people who don't have insurance in Maryland and across the nation. As I mentioned previously, I want to put it on to the cost of the product for Mexico and other countries that do not have health care comparable to what many of the Americans do have. It all comes down to a question of money. We're in a global economy, and you know what's happened. America is losing its metal in the middle class, but it's also losing those health care benefits. We've got to pay for it. I call it putting on a health care constraint. You're going to pay for health care one way or the other, and it can be blended with a single payer system. Thank you. Mr. Rails. We have the most expensive health care system in the world. We spend 16 percent of our GDP on health care, but as was mentioned, we have almost 50 million people that don't have health insurance. And we have local jurisdictions, you know, uh, playing off of each other. And it's unfortunate. But it's a national problem that deserves a national solution. This is one of the reasons I'm motivated to run for office. Washington is silent. Nothing's happened. I agree, Kweisi, we need a single-payer system at some point. But we can't afford to wait any longer. That's why I wrote a health care plan that calls on all businesses in 50 states, large and small, to enroll their employees in a health care plan now. And for the small businessman or woman, we'll give them tax credits to make sure we don't put them out of business and they can keep growing. We also need to move to electronic health records, which will save the health care system billions and billions of dollars. I want to bring my business experience and put it to work for the people of Maryland and the country so we can have a practical solution that's going to help people now when we don't have 60 million people in 10 years without health insurance. Mr. Cardin, 30 seconds. I'm the only person running for the United States Senate that's actually voted for universal health insurance coverage. I have done that. I've also have introduced legislation so that we can have a more cost-effective health care system on prescription drugs. I've authored that legislation, filed it on the first day of this session. So I've already taken action to deal with these issues. I serve on the committee that deals with it and have been voting consistently for the type of health care system that will preserve quality but expand access for all Americans. That's what we need to do in this country. I think I'm going to stand up for a little bit. We're to our last two questions. Juan Williams, you have a question for Mr. Rails. Mr. Rails, are there any drugs that you would vote to legalize if you were a U.S. Senator from Maryland? <laughs> No. Uh, I, think, I think our issue uh, is, is, number one, that we, we need to work more on drug treatment. This is, a, this is a serious problem. We have a lot of nonviolent offenders that keep being recycled, as I mentioned earlier, through uh, our criminal justice system where we're not giving them adequate treatment. We have to help these folks. Uh, you know, get, their, get themselves back on their feet. You saw Baltimore City triple their drug treatment from 18 to 54 million dollars. And lo and behold, last year they had the lowest number of deaths uh, from drug abuse in decades. This is the kind of stuff we need to be talking about. But even going beyond the whole issue of drugs, we have to find a way to prevent people from wanting to take drugs in the first place. And that's being committed to our children by raising our children in families where they get nurtured and where they get the kind of support at home, which is critical for them feeling secure. It's the insecurity and it's the sense of open emptiness that leads our children and young people to a path where they go on drugs to try and escape from problems that they were never really taught to solve. 
Uh, as a parent, I can tell you, it takes an enormous amount of work and commitment to make a child healthy and to make a child want to feel good about himself or herself. So let's start with the families also and make our families healthy so we can build a better society and not have this kind of drug problem. Finally, the whole issue of education, we keep coming back to that. If we can get our kids the crucial skills so that they can compete in an economy, they won't turn to a life of drugs out of frustration. We have to find a way to do that. I wrote a plan for that purpose, to bring the best and brightest teachers into our schools so that we can take kids from disadvantaged backgrounds where they don't have the support at home always and make them successful. These are, in sum, what I believe we need to do. I'd love to do it on behalf of the people of Maryland and the United States. Thank you. Don't have any drugs that would like to legalize, but I would agree with him on like the quality of life. And I'd like a national prevention of domestic violence program because violence is learned behavior. And if the children, they're victims of domestic violence. And in that, they learn to be violent. And then they look, they try to escape from it. A domestic violence cuts all across the land, all across ethnic boundaries, all across the world. We need a national program to prevent domestic violence, and I think that'll help the drug problem. Mr. Cardin. We, we need to deal with the drug problem in America. We need to deal with both on the supply and demand. We need to stop drugs coming in from America. It's one of the reasons why border security is so important. We talk about homeland security from the point of view of terrorists. We also need to get our ports secure from drugs coming into this country. That's why it's important that all containers be inspected. It's not just for the risk of terrorism is the risk of drugs coming into America. And then we have to deal with the supply issue. That's why I've opposed the Bush budget. Every budget he submitted has been shortchanging our programs to deal with our communities, to deal with after school programs, to deal with mentoring programs, to deal with alternatives so that children have a safe environment to deal with drug education programs, to deal with those issues. The budgets instead have been a priority for tax cuts for those who don't need it. Large deficits, and you've heard about that, that's dangerous for America's future. We need to have responsible budgeting and put our money where it's needed in the community and save our children and save our families. Mr. Coffin. The war on drugs is a misnomer. It's a war on drug addicts. And if it worked, we'd have the smallest drug addiction problem of any of the industrialized countries. Instead, we have the largest by far. We need to take the profits out of drugs, treat drug addicts as a uh, uh, public health issue, not as a criminal issue. Don't make felons out of them so they can't vote for the rest of their lives or get student loans or get a decent job. As far as drugs coming in across the border, that's absolute nonsense. There's no way in the world you can stop it. Look at a map of the United States. There's just too much border. You'd stop trade if you stopped all those trucks from coming through. And the profits are humongous. They go all the way up, and they serve the political purpose of our ruling class because in the 60s, young people in the uh, minority communities were becoming politicized, fighting against the injustice. The drugs came in wholesale, got them all hooked, and now young people are just standing around on the street corners, and that's the result of it. We need a process in which an addict can go to a clinic and get whatever he or she is addicted to. And with what we save on intervention and interdiction and all the rest of that nonsense that doesn't work, Thank you, Mr. we can have treatment on demand for everybody. Mr. Rails, 30 seconds. I don't have too much to add, but, but on a personal note, um, one of the thrills about running for the United States Senate and having the prospect of being your next senator is to try and be a role model for our young people in our society today. As I've traveled around the state, there's a tremendous amount of frustration with the leadership in this country and whether our leaders are sincere, whether they're really out for the best interest of the people. I think if we can create more people or elect more people to office that are excellent role models, we may be able to prevent our children from going the wrong way when they can aspire to be what some of us are in the United States Senate, where we're doing a great job in providing excellent leadership. Thank you. Ron Walter's last question for Mr. Kaufman. 
Mr. Kaufman, the Department of Criminal Justice at the University of Maryland is the most distinguished in the country. And a few years ago, it uh, came out with a report which found racial disparities in the use of the death penalty in the state. So I would like to ask uh, your position on the question of a moratorium on the death penalty and on the restoration of felony voting rights. <clears throat> We're the only industrialized country that has the death penalty. And if that worked, we'd have the lowest murder rate of any of the industrialized countries. Instead of that, we have the largest. It's as simple as that. I don't trust this government or our politicians to, to decide to take the life of anybody. I would much less fear being uh, put to death than spending 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years behind bars. It just doesn't work. It's inhumane. Uh, as far as felons are concerned, the prohibition of felons from voting came into existence after Reconstruction was destroyed, and the southern states got together to figure out, now, how are we going to stop black people from voting? And the poll tax, the grandfather clause, and all of that were knocked out. But they, the prohibition of felons was introduced at that time and the ACLU sent me a paper, and I've lost it since, in one of the southern states, I think it was Georgia, the le state legislature literally had a blackboard, and they wrote all the, the crimes that they felt black people were more likely to, to do, chicken stealing, adultery, et cetera, and they called them felonies. And then they wrote all the things they felt white people were likely to do, fighting and committing murder, and they called them misdemeanors, and that's why how we got the felony prohibition. In Europe, felons vote Prisoners vote, the prisons are cleaner, the corruption is less, and they get a leg up on the democratic process. No American should have to give up their right to vote. The judge and the jury should determine a, what the appropriate sentence is for that appropriate crime. The state shouldn't come back after that and say, aside from that, this whole bunch of people, many of them are there because they smoked a reefer or they couldn't, they couldn't get a job and they had to sell drugs to those who were addicted because they need the drugs and nobody else will supply them. And that's why they're there. And most of these people should be sent home uh, with, a, with a government guaranteed employment. Thank you. Mr. Cardin, Mr. Cardin. Indeed. If memory serves me correctly, I believe the lieutenant governor was going to take care of this issue four years ago when he was elected lieutenant governor of Maryland. Mm -hmm. And we're still waiting for that report as far as implementing change in our state. You're asking a very serious question that deals with the death penalty, which is primarily used at the state level. And it differs in every state in the nation. And there is a serious question as to the uniformity of penalty in this country, not only by race, but by geography. And I think we need to, to, to uh, have more work done as to whether that's appropriate or not. At the national level, I have supported legislation to make sure that we do the DNA testing, that we have the best information available. But you also asked questions beyond that as it relates to felons and people being able to vote. We should make it easier for people to vote in this country. I'm for early voting. I'm for other procedures so that we can get more people involved in the process. And I'm proud of the record of the Democratic Party in that regard, and I congratulate our legislators for taking the right steps to protect people's rights to vote. Mr. Rails. I'm opposed to the death penalty. Uh, number one, all the research shows that it doesn't deter the behavior that you're trying to deter. Number two, the death penalty is irrevocable. So if you make a mistake, if a person is wrongfully accused, if, a, if, if the defense that's provided isn't appropriate, if a judge is elected and is succumbing to the passions of the people that elect him or her, you have a serious problem. And there's a lot of history in this country where the death penalty was implemented incorrectly. And when it's irrevocable, what do you do? You can't bring the person back. So I have a real problem with that. And as Ben mentioned, there isn't a uniform application of this. You know, if you go to Baltimore County, it's been demonstrated that uh, blacks are convicted at much higher rates and sentenced to death than, say, in Baltimore City. 
So I take it off the table. I, if someone commits a heinous crime, I put them away for good, not let them out, keep them off the street so that they're not a threat to society. But don't take the risk that you accidentally kill an innocent man or woman. Thank you. With all due respect, I think Mr. Cardin's answer to the last question shows why we need new leadership in Washington. He was asked about felon voting. He didn't answer that tough question. Instead, he talked about early voting and other things all of us Democrats support. Let me say, I believe once you paid your debt to society, you should be allowed to vote, and we should not have these vestiges of racial discrimination besmirching our law books. And I've not only talked the talk, I have testified with civil rights groups in cases to end felon disenfranchisement. I've also testified with civil rights groups in cases against the egregious racial disparities in the administration of the death penalty. Whether you philosophically believe in the death penalty or not, it's clear our society cannot administer it with fairness across racial and class lines. Therefore, I believe we need to work together to end the death penalty as we know it, as well as to end felon disenfranchisement in America. Mr. Kaufman, 30 seconds. <clears throat> I think I pretty well covered that. Uh, however, let me say something, therefore, about terrorism, which hasn't been asked. This country has been terrorizing third world people since the genocide of the Native Americans and the middle passage of slavery. 9-11 happened because of that sort of thing continues. The single purpose of American foreign policy is to maximize the profits of the international corporations who in turn finance the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. Until we have a foreign policy that reflects the golden rule instead of the rule of gold and oil, a terrorism will continue against us. Thank you. Now is the time for closing statements. And we're reversing the order from the way we opened. So Mr. Kaufman has the first closing statement. Closing statements are 30 seconds. Any of you live in Baltimore, I'm going to be teaching a course at the Free University on Socialism. I know you're all interested in that. Uh, just give me a call. It comes out of the uh, Student Union uh, building at uh, Levering Hall. Uh, because most of you don't know what American foreign policy is really about, a, a professor at Hopkins has written an illustrated book addicted to war, why the U.S. can't kick the mili militarism. I bought 100 of them. I got about 40 of them left. They sell for $10. I'm selling them at half price for $5 at the table. We've raised $1,100 for the campaign. We've spent $1,600, and I expect $500 from this audience, so I'm not stuck with it. Mr. Kaufman, thank you very thank much. Thank you. <laughs> People often ask me why I decided to run for the United States Senate. Uh, and my answer is simple. Uh, our problems keep piling up and nothing's being done about it. I think we need a different approach. If we keep electing the same people, we shouldn't expect to get anything but the same results. Look at all the children that aren't getting a decent education because they happen to live in the wrong zip code. If you like the status quo, then I'm definitely not your guy. If you're looking for change, if you're looking for a new approach, if you're looking for fresh ideas, I'm definitely your man. Thank you. Mr. Cardin. We need six more Barbara Mikulskis and Paul Sarbaneses in the United States Senate, then we really can change the direction of America. I'm running for the United States Senate because I'm really worried about America's future. I'm worried. I'm worried about the security of our country. We've talked a little bit about the debt, but not much. It's owned by foreign governments that could change their mind at any time, jeopardizing the security of America. We haven't talked about energy today. I'm worried about our energy dependency. We have to worry about some country in the Middle East and how we determine our foreign policy, that's not national security. I'm worried about our foreign policy. We go to war in Iraq when there was no danger against our country. We've got to change the direction of America. And it starts with keeping the Senate seat and keep picking up six more and taking the House and then in two years taking the White House and then we will make a difference for the people we care about in this country. Well, if you'll vote in support, we'll bring a long-range energy program that will make fusion 
A fusion reactor is a reality within 40 years. You use the money in such a way that will have equal education, opportunity, EEO, all across the land. I'd like to close it with this. You've heard it say, God bless America. I say God has blessed America. And the question for me, for you, for Maryland and the nation is what are we going to do with the blessings that God has given us? Education. I'm going to keep going back to it over and over and over again. It's how we lift people. It's how we give hope. It's how we teach. The reason why the Maryland State Teachers Association and 64,000 teachers and educational support professionals have endorsed this candidacy is because they know we've got to fight for it and we've got to mean it. And let me tell you why I can say it differently, because I'm the guy that's not supposed to be here. I'm the high school dropout. I'm the one who was a teen parent. I'm the one who was on his way to hell in a handbasket. But people cared about me and told me what I could be. And we've got to say that to young people all over this state. When we do that, we do it for all of us. We give hope back into a system. And we inspire a process that will fix this government, change the system for all, create opportunity, and get past the divisions of race and everything else, and create a light in society. But we've got to have an opportunity for those persons like kids all over this state who can't fight for themselves. Thank, I need your you. support. I need your support. Thank you. Don't worry, I'm not selling books. <laughs> It's going to take bold new thinking to change our country. In 1991, I published the first edition of my book, The Keys to the White House. When Daddy Bush was president and every conventional Democrat thought he was unbeatable in 92, I wrote, he lacks vision and will be a one-term president. No conventional politician listened, but I got a call from the special assistant to Governor Bill Clinton, who said, Lickman, are you serious that George Bush can be beaten in 92? I sent Bill Clinton a copy of my book and the memo and the rest is history. So let's unite together and make history once again Thank with you, real Mr. leadership Lickman. and real change here in Maryland. Thank you. Well, first I want to thank the candidates for letting me interrupt them, kind of. Second, I want to thank the timers who did a great job. Third, I want to thank our co-sponsors, the African American Democratic Club of Prince George's County and Florence Brody and the Brody family. I'd like to thank our wonderful questioners, Ron Walters and Juan Williams.